Shalom. I'm so glad you've decided to join us here as we celebrate in this beautiful sanctuary, Baruch Hashem Messianic Synagogue in Dallas, Texas. I'm David Brickner, Executive Director of Jews for Jesus. Behind me, you can see the Ark of the Covenant, those doors which will be opened, and we will have a Torah service as part of our viewing of this great feast. You know, there are seven festivals in the Jewish calendar. In Leviticus chapter 23, we see all of them. And three of those seven were called Aliyah festivals. Aliyah is a Hebrew word that means to go up. And so three times a year, all Jewish men were required to go up to Jerusalem. Now you need to understand that you could be at the top of Mount Everest. And from the biblical perspective, if you're going to Jerusalem, you're going up. Because that's where God chose to make his name. That's where the temple and the center of worship for the Jewish people was. And so we are going up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And this feast is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16. And I'm reading verse 9 and following. Count off seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. Then celebrate the feast of weeks to the Lord your God by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessings the Lord your God has given you. And rejoice before the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. You, your sons and daughters, your men servants and maidservants, the Levites in your towns and the aliens, the fatherless and the widows living among you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and follow carefully these decrees." Now, the interesting thing about this festival is that there are a number of different names for them. And that this is all connected to the very first verse we read, which is count off seven weeks. So there really is a sense of anticipation. Uh, we are from the celebration of Passover to have a countdown. Each day is commemorated. This counting down produces anticipation for the celebration of this Aliyah festival called weeks. Shavuot is the Hebrew word sevens. And there's another name for the festival, Pentecost, which in Greek means 50 days. So if you count down seven weeks, that's 49 plus one is 50. So are you with me? Harvest, Pentecost, Shavuot, all of these things, the Feast of Weeks, are what we're celebrating today. And because it was an agricultural festival, this countdown is also called counting the Omer. Omer is the Hebrew word for sheaf. So there is a sheaf of wheat or a sheaf of barley, whatever grain it is, at the point where you can actually cut that sheaf, that's about when we're going to be celebrating. In fact, there are seven species of what's being harvested in the land of Israel at this time. And they are wheat and barley, but also pomegranates, grapes, olives, dates, and figs. And so as we gather in the harvest, we're supposed to present the tithe, 10% of the produce of the land. And as we come up to Jerusalem, we're to come in a certain way. And in fact, in Deuteronomy 26, we actually get the liturgy of what Israel is supposed to say and do as they come up at the end of this countdown. It says, when you have entered the land, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. 
and say to the priest in office at the time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord swore to our forefathers to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. Do you see the liturgy? Do you see the pageantry? Do you see the sense of celebration? One of the commands that we've read from the, score, the scroll is that we are to rejoice before the Lord. So there's a lot of celebration. There's a lot of singing connected with the celebration of Pentecost. But what we also see is one other very important aspect besides the agricultural aspect, besides the harvest aspect. If you count down 50 days for from the Passover, when the children of Israel were actually delivered from the land of Egypt, according to the rabbis, now you can't exactly find this in the Torah, but according to the rabbis, the 50th day, Shavuot weeks Pentecost, that was the very same day that Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of stone. And so we are actually in this festival celebrating the giving of the law. And you'll notice right up here, I have with me two loaves of bread. Now this is challah bread. It's egg bread that's twisted. It's absolutely delicious. We have it every Shabbat as part of a Kiddush, but we also especially have these two loaves to remind us of the two tablets of stone that Moses brought down from the mountain on Shavuot. One other thing, if you have a few pieces during Shabbat, that means tomorrow morning's gonna be French toast because challah makes the best French toast. That's just a little side note. One of the things that we believe about the law is that it is good. Many people throughout history have reckoned the law as passé, as burdensome to the point of being not good. But that's not what the scriptures tell us. Neither the Old or the New Testament speak about the law in disparaging terms. Rather, the law is good. In Psalm 19, verse 7, it says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And then in Psalm 119, verse 103, the psalmist says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So as we have the focus in Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks on Torah, we have this bread and we eat it with honey. 
And it reminds us of the sweetness of the law that was given to us at Mount Sinai. And also today in Jewish homes and celebrations of Shavuot, we're going to have dairy products, which of course remind us that the land that God brought us into was the land of milk and honey. And my favorite dairy product that we enjoy at Shavuot is cheesecake. It's a wonderful confection. There's all kinds of cheesecakes. I love Eli's cheesecake. I just, any kind of cheesecake, I'll have it with cherries on top, with blueberries on top, but it's so good. And of course, there are lots of other dairy foods that we eat at this time as well, all to remind us of the sweetness of the law that was given in the land of milk and honey when we entered it. And I just have to say that God also wants to remind us of that as part of our daily life. We're to uh, eat the word of God, to consume the word of God and find that it brings light to our eyes and inspiration to our heart. This year, I'm on a path to read through the entire Bible chronologically in one year. And it's a challenge, and maybe you've never done that before. But whatever it is that you can do to consume the Word, to taste the Word, to experience the sweetness of God's Word in your life, it will brighten your perspective, it will lighten your eyes, it will give wisdom to you for daily life. As we read the Torah, as we read the Ten Commandments, we also, at the time of Shavuot, read the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth has as its backdrop the barley story. And so the, the barley harvest is a big part of, you'll remember, Ruth and Boaz and what was going on that ultimately brought them together. And so out of that we read, and, and we're reminded in the story by the rabbis of the giving of the law that Israel, when they were waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain, actually fell asleep. So we were supposed to be awake, I don't know, praying, whatever, and instead we fell asleep. And ever since then, it's been customary in the Jewish community, especially for the men, the night before Shavuot, the night before the festival, to try and stay up all night long. And what are we doing? We're reading the book of Ruth. We're reading the Ten Commandments. We're studying the law. The Word of God really is powerful. And when you're feeling anxious or when you're feeling worried about your test or whatever else may be happening in your life, go to the Word of God and allow it to give wisdom to you, to calm your hearts. And, and, and this is the richness of the feast. If, if Passover is all about redemption, that is God's deliverance of the Jewish people from bondage and slavery in Egypt, then Pentecost, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, is all about revelation. God illuminating his truth, God giving us his word, the law for Mount Sinai, so that we can follow him and live lives of productive holiness before him. But therein comes the rub, right? Because you see that while the law is good, not so much us. We struggle and we strain and we find it difficult to keep the law. And so ultimately God had a plan to fulfill the Pentecost. Just as Passover is fulfilled in Jesus, so Pentecost is also fulfilled in the Messiah. And we see that when we begin to turn to the pages of the New Testament, that it was God's plan all along to fulfill Shavuot in the Messiah. First of all, in the notion of first fruits. And we're going to turn to that now. We're talking now about the fulfillment of Shavuot. Okay, are you with me? So the first part of Shavuot is the harvest aspect of it. And we're going to see that it's fulfilled also in Yeshua. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, Paul tells us, But Messiah has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Messiah all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Messiah, the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. That's what Paul is telling us. And so when he uses that term first fruits twice in that section of scripture, it's not a random use of the word. He's literally telling us this is a fulfillment of this festival in the Messiah, through the resurrection, and all of us who participate in the resurrection, not just now, but for the future, we are also the first fruits. That's what James says. When we join ourselves to Yeshua, who is the first fruits of the dead, it says he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So you can see there's this language that's used from the New Testament that goes back to that first festival that we read about in Deuteronomy. We're the first fruits. Messiah is the first fruits from the dead. And Paul talks about this also in terms of the coming of the Spirit, which we're about to jump into very quickly. Not only so, in Romans 8, 23, Paul says, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So Paul is telling us the first fruits isn't just about the resurrection. It's ultimately fulfilled in the coming of the Holy Spirit. And this is also a wonderful second piece that we see fulfilled in Pentecost. The first was the fruits, and that's fulfilled in Jesus in his resurrection from the dead. The second is the giving of the law, and that is also fulfilled in the story of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now, you'll remember in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus gives us the Great Commission. Go into all the world, beginning in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Preach the gospel to all creatures. Make disciples. This Great Commission in all of its various forms throughout the New Testament is uniquely related to to God's intention going all the way back to the giving of the law. Because while the law was given to Israel, it was intended to be a blessing for all the nations. And while Israel was the keeper of the law, the bearer of the law, the people of the book, ultimately all of God's creation was to benefit from the Torah, from the law. And yet the law, the Bible tells us, was weak not in and of itself, but in the flesh. And so God had to send the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, in order to apply the law to our hearts in a way that would enable us ultimately to fulfill it. And so imagine yourself as one of those pilgrims on your way with your basket of fruit, making your way from, let's say, Beersheba in the south, all the way up to Jerusalem. You're making Aliyah, going to the temple, and you've made it, but it's nighttime. The following day is going to be the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, Shavuot. And so you've rolled out your little mat you're going to sleep on at night, and the temple is up high. You can see it from where you're sleeping under the stars, and you fall asleep. What's your alarm clock that day? Well, it is a row of priests who've gathered on the parapet of the temple, and they're about to call you to worship through the blowing of the shofar. Here's one of them, but you have to listen and imagine the sound of a multitude of priests, all with shofars, all blowing them in unison, and the sound echoing down from the temple, across the Kidron Valley, echoing, bouncing off the rocks, and reverberating back. And this is going to wake you up to the celebration that's just underway.
the blast of the shofar that all of the children of Israel would have been awoken to in their preparation to bring their baskets up to the temple. And so they would begin the journey, the final journey, to make their offering before the Lord, to read from Deuteronomy 26 and to pay their tithe. But on this particular day, you'll recall from the account in Acts chapter 2, there was another sound that interrupted them on their journey and actually pulled them away toward an upper room where some 120 of Yeshua's followers had gathered together in fulfillment of his command to tarry, to wait until that which he had promised, the coming of the Holy Spirit, was there. And so that's what they were doing. It was 10 days after the resurrection that Yeshua ascended into glory. We find that in Acts chapter 1. So they were tarrying how many days? 40 more days. Ultimately, with the 10 before the ascension and the 40 after, now in Acts chapter 2, we find ourselves at the day of Pentecost. Are you with me? And all of a sudden, a sound. And the scriptures tell us it's like a mighty rushing wind. Well, that shofar sounds something incredible as well. But, you know, I have to imagine that we're using human language now to describe a supernatural sound. Some people have tried to describe what a hurricane sounds like, and they say it sounds like a freight train coming. You know, when John speaks about the voice of Yeshua in Revelations chapter 1, he says it sounds like the rushing of mighty waters, kind of like a waterfall. So we have experiences in our life that, you know, approximate what things sounded like. But on that day when Pentecost was fulfilled, when the revelation of God's word was no longer going to be just on the page, but in the heart, by the coming of the Holy Spirit, there was a sound, a mighty rushing wind. But we have to remember the drama of what's going on here in Acts chapter 2. These great special effects that are recorded, the sound of the rushing mighty wind, the flames of fire, the speaking in tongues, these are special effects that are designed to point us to the greater plot of what God is doing. And to get stuck in just the special effects is like going to a movie and leaving, and I'm just forgetting about the plot. <laughs> but there's a much bigger plot that stretches from Mount Sinai all the way to Jerusalem and all the way into your home and your heart even now. And so we want to remember that in Exodus chapter 20, when God gave the law, the scriptures tell us that there was a mortal fear that came over the nation, that the mountains started to smoke, that there was thunder and trumpet sounds. And we're told that there was a sound from heaven that sounded like a ram's horn or a trumpet that increasingly got louder and louder. You know, sometimes a sound gets so loud, you're not just hearing it with your ears, you're hearing it inside your body. And it kind of shakes you. And that's the kind of sound, this pulsing crescendo, the scriptures give us this idea of what's happening. And we are now seeing not just the sound, but we're seeing the sights. We're seeing flames of fire that make uh, Macy's 4th of July fireworks look like a child's sparkler. There's amazing, the Lord, when he descends on the mountain, he descends in fire. And, you know, there are ancient manuscripts that accompany the Torah where the rabbis have given additional information about what they heard had happened. And here's just one of them. When the law was given, the Ten Commandments, quote, the first commandment, when it left the mouth of the Holy One, left as meteors and lightning and as torches of fire, a fiery torch to its right, a fiery torch to its left, with burst forth and flew in the air of the heavenly expanse and proceeded to circle around the camp of Israel. Now, imagine you were in that upper room in Jerusalem. You were one of the 120. And there's a whole crowd of people that have gathered outside where you're sitting, 
because there's this sound that's just shaking everything. And then all of a sudden you look and you see all of your friends having a flaming torch of fire on top of their heads. And you look up and you realize you have one too. Talk about a conflagration, 120 flaming torches all in a small upper room. I mean, this was a sight unheard of. And the scriptures tell us that the voice of the Lord, the psalmist says, shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. That's Psalm 29, verses 7 and 8. And there's other literature that has similar language describing first the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, and now in Acts chapter 2, the giving of the Spirit, which fulfills the giving of the law. And we, knew that, we know that God gave those special effects at Mount Sinai to impress upon the people of Israel there was something sacred going on. Similarly, God gave those special effects in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 to impress upon us that something amazing was going on. And what was that? It was the fulfillment of Pentecost so that God himself might reverse the curse of the Tower of Babel. Do you remember that story? In Genesis chapter 11, there was a tower that was being built for human beings to show God that they could do things on their own. And God said, oh, you're getting out of line here. And he confused their languages. And he cursed them so that they couldn't understand one another. And they began to speak different languages and scatter across the world. But now, for the first time in Acts chapter 2, people are speaking different languages. And those in the upper room were speaking languages they hadn't even learned. These tongues, but they were all the same language because they were praise to God, thanksgiving to God. And so all of the people that had gathered together to celebrate Pentecost, to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. Jewish people from different parts of the land, the scriptures say in Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, that there was Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Lydia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya adjoining Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues. And what are they speaking? The praises of God. Honor and glory and power unto him. And so the coming of the Holy Spirit not only reversed the curse of the Tower of Babel, it reversed the curse of our inability to keep the law. The law is good and righteous and holy, and we are not. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, that law is no longer an onerous burden that we always will fail. But Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, that this Holy Spirit in us makes all the difference in the world. This fulfillment of the law is in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that amazing? Someone comes up to me and says, David, do you keep the law? And I will be very happy to tell them, not in myself, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, yes, I do keep the law. Why? Because Jesus is the only one in all of human history who ever kept the law. And because by his spirit, he now indwells me, because his righteousness is now mine, yes, the answer, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 4, is that I can keep the righteous requirements of the law. How? by walking according to the Spirit. That's the fulfillment of Pentecost. That's what Shavuot is all about. That's what the Feast of Weeks is. If Passover is about redemption, Pentecost is about revelation. The revelation of God's law through the Torah revealed in us 
fulfilled in us through the power of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit of God that has now come. And so wherever you are today, you can love the law. Wherever you are today, you can walk by the Spirit and fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. Wherever you are today, this reality should fix your eyes, your gaze on the future because all of this, as we read from the beginning, has to do with the kingdom of God and the coming of God's purposes for this world. And there is a way in which as a fulfillment of the Great Commission, we are working towards the ultimate, the final fulfillment of Pentecost. All of the nations of Israel gathered together, hearing the praises of God around the throne. That's what we're doing. And so when we share the good news of the gospel, when we share about Messiah, the first fruits from the dead, when we invite people to believe in him and to receive the Holy Spirit, we're inviting them to join the party to rejoice with us in what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will yet do. And the image, the picture of this future is so powerful. From the book of Revelation, the song that is sung, with your blood, Messiah Jesus, you purchase people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And then John said, then I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and unto the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen.